Okay, welcome everyone to the December Juice Lecture and uh, early happy holidays to you all. If this is your first time attending the Juice Lecture, a special welcome to you. Uh, we have monthly presentations and if you would like to be on the mailing list for uh, future presentations, please email me or text me or uh, chat with me after the, uh, the talk today. So today we are delighted to have Dr. Shane Sweet talk to us, uh, present to us his, uh, his work. And Dr. Sweet is an exercise and health psychology, disability, and community-based researcher. He's an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Medicine <laughs> and holds a Canadian chair, research chair in participation, well-being, and physical disability. The overarching goal of Shane's program of research is to enhance the lives of adults living with disability and or chronic diseases, and he achieves these goals across two streams, the first stream being adapted physical activity and the second being spinal cord injury SCI peer support. In his adapted physical activity stream, he focuses on building an understanding of the process to help people with physical disabilities engage in physical activity while identifying and testing solutions to overcome important physical activity barriers. And for the SCI peer support stream, he currently leads a pan-Canadian community university partnership aimed to develop tools to optimize peer support for people living with SCI. And during his leisure time, when he has them, he enjoys playing and watching sports, jogging, reading crime novels, and comic books. So the title of his talk today is Spinal Cord Injury Peer Support, Outcome Identification and Development of a National Evaluation Tool. And he has uh, informed me that he welcomes questions at any point, so feel free to interrupt him. If you have a question, you can also put it in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and asking him questions as they come. And or if you uh, would like to raise your hand, that's an option as well. So feel free to interrupt. We'll also have time afterwards for any additional questions that you may have. So uh, without further ado, Shane, the floor is yours. Great, excellent. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction. I will do the technology stuff now share that work okay. okay looking good that looks good i'll pop this in my screen great um thank you everybody thank you for for taking time out of your day to to join me in, in this presentation and thanks again for the invitation to to present this um today i know i know this time of year is always always busy and and i really appreciate some of that extra time that you provided here. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, throughout. If we get into a conversation, that, that's that's also fantastic. So um, so today I'll, I'll talk uh, mostly about the work that we've done with regards to spinal cord injury uh, uh, peer support. So before we get uh, started, I think it's always important to take a few moments to acknowledge the lands to which we are situated. Um, I spend a lot of my quality time with friends and family I enjoy my leisure activities and engage in rich dialogue with colleagues and community partners and students on the unceded or stolen, stolen lands of the Haudenosaunee and National Big Nations. And I really uh, thank the caretakers of these lands. So please take a minute to, to acknowledge the land that you're in today. So before going, um, I always like to starting a little bit about my journey so you know who I am and where I come from. I'm Franco-Ontarian, so I am I'm bilingual and have an accent in French and English, so um, you'll, you'll probably hear the French come out here and there today. Um, one of the things that I'm probably most proud uh, in my in my life is actually being our family owned a, a chip stand, and I like to, to say that I'm a really connoisseur of poutine and, and, and really strictly evaluate quality of poutine when I have them based on experience there. So, but it's interesting that the role in terms of, of managing and thinking about my uh, running a chip stand actually informed a lot of parts of, of my academic experience. Um, so it's really formidable years for me in terms of that. So I'm really proud to, to share that with you today. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Ottawa and actually started in criminology before moving to, to, to psychology. So you can see that my, my interest has, has shifted over the years. 
I then completed my PhD and stayed at the University of Ottawa, where I was focused mostly on cardiac rehabilitation. It is when I joined, uh, did my postdoc. So I was doing my postdoc at Queen's University with Amy Latimer at McMaster when Kathleen Martin Guinness was at McMaster and Université Laval with uh, Luc Noro, who, who is now retired, is where I got um, the exposure in terms of, of the disability research. And that's where I really grew the passion for this, this line of, um, of research. And during that time, I also lived in Ottawa. So train planes and automobiles was really the, the, the framework of my postdoc for those two years. So lots of traveling. And then I started McGill in 2013, where I focused a lot of my work more in the disability field, where we started working and creating my lab and engaged um, actively with the community uh, in, in the spinal cord injury domain. Since then, my, my lab has continued to grow. And one of the things that we're most proud of is that we, we developed four lab values to which we were able to, to continuously reflect um, on uh, throughout our processes and interactions together. So uh, the, the core values that I try to share in, in with my students in my lab and also in my partnerships are balance, collaboration, compassion, curiosity, growth, respect, uh, and trust. Um, uh, unfortunately, today's is a little bit with, with heavy heart. Um, one of our key lab members, uh, Jacques Camo, has passed away four weeks ago. Four weeks ago today, so it's a bit of an emotional day for me today. I, I want to acknowledge his role both as a friend, mentor, and leader in shaping a lot of the work that we talked uh, that I'm talking about today. He's been with me since I started at McGill. Uh, he was a peer peer mentor in the community organization, and so I first met him ten years ago. And when he retired from that role, the last two years he's worked uh, in, in our lab as a research assistant and providing that rich uh, lived experience from a person living with a disability as well as um, a, a past peer peer mentor. So um, there's moments I, I get emotional or lose train of thought. I'm just still uh, managing and dealing with the emotions of losing, losing a dear, dear friend um, only four weeks ago. Um, so as, as Brian mentioned, I have two main streams of, of research. So adaptive physical activity and, and peer support. And today we're really going to focus on that, that peer support, but I'm happy to discuss uh, any other components of, of, uh, of the research. So in the peer support work, I, we, we do work around evaluation, we look at understanding processes and mechanisms. And now I'm starting to build uh, elements in terms of creating training and resources for, for community-based organizations to continue to help optimize um, peer support uh, programs. All of the peer support work is, is done in, in partnership using integrated knowledge translation guiding principles. And we work with community organizations um, across Canada. So, so, so these uh, organizations help inform uh, and, and help the decision-making process throughout the entire process from conceptualizing a study to, to some of the knowledge products that, that we're creating as well. So it's a really important part because most of the, the ideas are, are community-driven and we, we aim to do a research to, to meet um, those, those needs to make it more uh, impactful and, and, and usable in that sense. So before, really diving in, I think it's just important to have some key definitions. So when I talk about peer support, um, I talk about um, mutual support that's provided between two individuals. And I see peer support as the broader uh, term. For the first few years of actually a partnership, we often refer to peer mentorship, um, which, is, which is a form of peer support. It's a bit more purposeful and unidirectional where peer mentors providing that support to a mentee. And in the last couple of years, we've changed more to peer support because the community organizations don't only do peer mentorship. They also uh, provide some peer support opportunities that are not necessarily as unidirectional. So you'll see some of the language. There might be some peer support, a peer mentorship uh, embedded in some of the images we created before, but we're really focusing more on the broader spectrum of peer support. When we, refer, when we refer to peer mentors, they're individuals with a lived experience who provide support to, to other individuals. And then um, peer mentees are the individuals with lived experience who are receiving the support from other, other individuals with that same lived experience. So I'll be using those terms a lot today. So I just thought it was important that we have a bit of context to define those terms. Okay, so um, one of the first studies we, we conducted, we, there's this quote that came from one of the participants. If there's one thing I could do, I would press a button for SCIP support to be better resource, more of a priority, 
and more widely available for people with spinal cord injuries. I think it's phenomenally important. I think it's incredibly valuable. And through interactions and discussions with the various qualitative studies with different people, it really highlights this magic of, of peer support. There's this magic to it, but it's really hard to actually capture it. So we went on the process to try to uncover, identify what this 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 magic is behind peer support and see if, we, if there's a way that we can assess it and evaluate it. So the first kind of way that we looked at this um, is through uh, looking from an evaluation perspective. So this is gonna be the bulk of my talk. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through the path that we've been taking to try to develop an evaluation tool to better assess the outcomes of SCI peer support um, in, 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 this, in this context. From this sort of ground or the basis of this research, uh, different kind of research programs, different research questions emerged. Um, so we, we started doing research on peer mentors specifically in terms of the characters or outcome, the organizational processes to implement and deliver peer support, as well as consideration for implementing peer support in a rehab context. And now we're in the process of developing different programs and toolkits and frameworks that help guide and, and be able to continue to optimize peer, peer support uh, services and training. So, um, but as I mentioned today, the focus is really going to be about the outcome identification and, and evaluation tool. So we, I talked about the, the magic and trying to, to understand uh, the magic and, and, and some of the main issues that we encountered when we were first investigating the magic in our studies and looking at some of the studies in the literature Although some of these studies show the positive of peer support, a lot of their effect sizes are small. Um, so when we hear people qualitatively, it's it's critical. But then when when we start to do it quantitatively, we see that the effects are not having as much impact as that qualitative uh, nature of it. So um, so we we launched into this partnership and really trying to to develop that tool to better capture that magic and better evaluate the impact that SCI peer support has uh, on, on people living with spinal cord injury. So this is a bit where our path um, began. So our first our first destination was really trying to understand the outcomes uh, of, of peer support. So what, what, is, what are the benefits that people are getting from engaging in those peer support programs and services? So I'll start with the main result. So usually we always end with the result, but I'm actually gonna start that from this investigation, we actually found 87 unique outcomes to SCI peer support programs. So that's a whole bunch of outcomes. So how, how do we get to this number? How do we get there to identifying these um, outcomes? Is one of the first things we did is we did a, a meta synthesis where we analyzed qualitatively um, elements from organizational, so over 80 documents from annual reports, magazines, uh, any information on testimonials and their websites that documented any outcomes or benefits uh, or, or cost of engaging in peer support uh, programs. And we also did a systematic review of the literature and qualitative studies and identified 20 research um, articles. So one of the, 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 the big uh, qualitative um, examination from is finding out what exists in, in the literature and what exists within the organizational um, repertory and, and start pulling all this information into to, to code uh, in, in those components. So we, from this, we, we, we had a, a number of, uh, of data points. In the meantime, as we're doing this search, we're also conducting interviews with people who were involved in, in the peer support programs. So we interviewed um, 36 individuals, uh, peer mentees, mentors, also family members of, of mentees. So look at that broader context, um, seeing elements that could, ele uh, that could impact um, individuals who are receiving peer support and eight, eight employees and staff from the community organization as well um, to, to get that, that, that broader aspect. So one of the, one of the example of, of the outcomes that was from those interviews was uh, this this idea of under, understanding or feeling understood. And one of the quotes from one of the mentees was, it helps to know that somebody really understands what you're going through, especially when people say, oh yeah, I understand. But how? You're an able-bodied person. How could you possibly understand what I'm going through? So talking really about having that peer support really helps to know that somebody does really understand that, 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 that component from it. So looking at all these different outcomes that came from the commuter organizational reports, um, the, the, the scientific literature, as well as the interview, is that 
we then uh, coded them into those 87 unique outcomes of peer support. And then from there, we, we, we um, categorized them into 18 sub-themes. So these in, in this, in this um, circle wheel here, you'll see in blue. Um, so they range anywhere from, from developing skills to, to, to motivation, independence, and, and getting new information. And from these sub-themes, we then um, uh, created six main categories, which ends up being one of the main models and frameworks we use to think about outcomes of, of peer support. So these main, six main categories are knowledge, participation, adaptation, connection, growth, and independence. So through, through this, this uh, process, well, what we set out to do is identify some of those key outcomes for peer mentees. And a lot of the, the, the outcomes that are listed here are, are outcomes for peer mentees. But the one thing that we weren't necessarily intending and, and, and looking at were actually outcomes of peer mentors. So peer mentors talked about the growth and, and, and building resilience and their ability uh, as, as people living with SCI as being peer mentors. But there's also a little bit of that dark side to, to peer mentorship and the emotional toll and, and, and the fatigue that happens in providing mentorship. And that's something that was really unexpected uh, in when we were doing this first line of research and where one of the mentor mentioned, there's a danger of em emotional contamination. I mean, because as a mentor, I'm still a person living with SCI, dealing with everyday stuff. If I'm feeling kind of precarious about that, then on, then on the top of that, I'm now dealing with someone who's also got a very, very serious issue that can become difficult to manage emotionally. So talking, so this kind of, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, developed a whole side project on specifically about mentors and looking at, at, at how do we help mentors cope with, with some of these emotional goals and, and compassion fatigue. So this, this first step in this first phase of looking at outcome identification really showed us that peer mentoring program has a widespread impact. Uh, the 87 was definitely way more than we had ever anticipated or expected. We also identified outcomes both for mentees and mentors and provided really as indication that we need we need to organize some of these, these outcomes. So we have the, the model to streamline them. Also, which one of those 87s are truly the most important because obviously we can't assess all those 87s, it's, 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 it's impossible. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the second step that we took was really trying to look at a process to how we narrow down, how do we focus to be able to ensure that if we're going to develop a way to assess some of these main outcomes, which ones are the most important. Um, so through, through this second step, we went into uh, using consensus, consensus methodologies and, and Delphi to be specific looking at ways to narrow down some of those outcomes. So essentially, uh, from our first consensus study where we had mentees, mentors, and organizational staff rate all the 87 outcomes, we were able to reduce it from 87 to 25 outcomes being a very important, at least, uh, or, or one of the most important. So essentially, just to, to give you a sense, is that for each of those 87 outcomes, uh, the, the participants would rate on using this scale so the extent to which they felt that the outcome was either irrelevant or one of the most uh, important outcome. And we did this across three rounds. Um, and every round would eliminate the ones that didn't hit the metric of being at least very important. Uh, so a score of eight or higher. So every time that we have outcomes, we would narrow down to start 87, then in the 60s. And then the final round got really narrowed down to 25. And I think what's what's the one thing that was interesting and in, in our team deliberated a lot about was that well, the overall uh, using some of the, the metrics was to keep those those 25 um, remaining uh, in the last round. You can see here that me some mentors and staff had rated more um, outcomes as being more important in terms of in the, the metrics, meeting the metrics. And the mentees had actually had less. There's only, they only talked about eight really um, being the very important or one of the most important throughout everybody. So um, what, it, through a discussion with, with our, our, our partnership, essentially we decided to keep the overall uh, because the mentors and staff have exposure to many um, uh, individuals and many mentees, while the mentees would likely rate their own experiences. So it might be a bit little too limiting. So we went on and, and um, really focused on sort of the global perspective of, of those 25 in this first phase. 
Shane, you have a Peter? hand up yeah. from Peter? Uh, Peter. Hey, Peter. Hey, Shane. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Not too bad. I just had a quick question. Um, yeah. um, in your in your evaluation, um, what what is the time frame in which you're evaluating? Like, is it um one year post injury in the evaluation? Is it in the early stages? I'm interested to know around how the acceptance of value of peer support is 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 recognized. Like, I'm thinking about the new injury that maybe not even has accepted the fact that they are going to have a spinal cord injury and close themselves off to wanting peer support because they may perceive, you know, that I don't want to have a disability. And if I accept um, peer support, um, I'm kind of admitting that I'm living with a disability. And was there any techniques or strategies or or things that came in your research that helped mentors introduce peer support to a newly injured person in a, in, in a way in which they recognize the value? Excellent question. So the, 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 I guess the one caveat of this research has been, has been people uh, with one year post SCI. So we're not capturing the acute phase necessarily uh, because the community partners talked about the importance of having individuals who had experience the, the, the peer support and, and had experienced um, the peer support. Uh, either Every organization have a different ways of inter, in, introducing their, their peer support. Some are more in the rehab phase and other ones are a bit more in the, in the community phase. So to capture a bit that broader diversity, we, we went with individuals who were at least one year post. Uh, but your question of uh, strategies and tools, we, we haven't got to that piece yet, but it has been raised in our partnership about one of the keys. So it's, it's, get, it's like in our top three list of next research to investigate is how to do that introduction earlier on um, to help mentors facilitate in, uh, for individuals who are newly injured or even individuals who are in the community but aren't really sold on peer support. What are the ways to bring them into peer support programs? It's definitely something that the organizations have been Told us that they're feeling, and it's something that is on our our, our list to, to be able to target um, soon. So does that, that kind of get to your question, Peter? Yeah, it's it, it's a work in progress, is what yes. I'm hearing. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I don't have the answer. I don't have uh, the answer for you at uh, this point because we haven't investigated that um, that part of it yet. Excellent. I'm glad you're looking at that because I think Good. that's the hardest part. Is because once the person's in and sees the value. Then they build their own social networks around yeah. peer support, um, leaning on who has expertise on personal experience, where and how based on their life. But yeah. it's more that, well, where? how do I get to the point where I'm seeing that value now and I'm building my own network? Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly it. And I think from an organizational standpoint, finding out what these outcomes up and developing this tool was critical to to be able to better assess and show the the true impact of these programs, and then we're as as we're finishing this, then we can get into optimizing and looking at these strategies to to make all of that more more effective. Excellent, thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, um, so so from that first consensus study, we're able to reduce it from eighty seven to twenty five outcomes, and then um, we actually worked with. Um, SCI Canada and their their organization their the organizational executive across Canada to also do a rating activity of those 25 to find out if any of them are still relevant or are impactful and doing that same um the same assessment with that same scale uh if, you know we showed that those 25 are actually highly relevant and highly uh, sought out by the community organizations with 21 of 25 remaining after that that round. So that provides us with uh, a more manageable set of outcomes to start working with in, in trying to understand and develop a tool to better evaluate the, 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 the SCI peer support work. Um, so fr from there, we, uh, and through our, our, our meeting and looking at those 21 outcomes, we actually removed some and, and, and adding one um, to, to get at uh, the 20 main outcomes that we're, we're looking at to develop. So essentially, um, 
we have, uh, these are the 20 outcomes that were deemed as to be most important from, from the Delphi activities and the consensus activities with our partnership. So uh, from participation, it's community involvement, adaptation, it's transition to community or out of, out of rehab and health skills and self-care skills. Understanding um, in terms of connection, reduced isolation and normalization. In terms of growth, there's per perseverance, hope, positive mental health, happiness, quality of life, dignity, resilience, hoping, and positive attitude. And independence is independence, belief in oneself, and confidence. And then SCI knowledge for knowledge. So these were the 20 outcomes that were deemed to be one of the most important. And there's, these are the ones that really um, got us to focus on when we're trying to develop our evaluation tool or evaluation survey. So then how do we go ahead and assess these 20 outcomes in a way that is both um, sensitive to uh, community needs and, and, and uh, community resources. So to develop that process, uh, we first did a database search of existing single or multiple uh, item measures that, that meet those criteria. We then did a quality assessment of the items. We, consult, we did a consultation with, with uh, community organizations across Canada. And then we did the final steps in terms of looking at face validity and, and also uh, reliability. So essentially some of the details of those steps is that um, we actually did a, a, a systematic database search and, and looked at some of those items. We looked specifically as much as we can find for single item measures because the idea was that these questionnaires and these tools cannot be lengthy for community organizations to be realistically implementing and using to assess their outcomes. And then we use any multi-item measures. We specifically looked at individual uh, items that seem to be the strongest. And what we found in this first round was actually 97 items rep for, for those 20 outcomes. So obviously 97 is, is still too, too big because the organizations really wanted to focus on one outcome per, um, per uh, one item per, per each outcome. So what we did is that a first step is researchers reviewed and rated the items and got them down to, to uh, uh, about 50, 60 of those from that 97. Then we have four community partners and two researchers that rated the remaining items. And then from those ratings, we had a few consultation meetings with the whole partnership to come to consensus on the items, the appropriate wording change in the STEM, which we then finished our first draft of the evaluation tool using 20 items, which represents one item per outcome. And a couple of key things from those consultation meeting and those decision-making meeting from a partnership is coming up with a STEM that provides the context for peer support. So the idea here, the STEM that we came up is thinking about my experience with, and then having what's in square brackets is the organizations to be able to, to add their specific name of their peer support program in there to provide that context for respondents. Um, and the idea here was to capture more about uh, general use from, from uh, um, year end surveys or, 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 or uh, every six months type um, surveys rather than than pre-post because the organizations are most likely have the capacity at this moment to do more of the, the end, end of year surveys type thing. And then we also chose anchors using a semantic difference scale. So we wanted to avoid satisfaction or agreement scale because that usually just assesses level of satisfaction, not actual looking at changes in some elements. So sometimes the, the rating scales could go from nothing to great deal or no tips and tricks to a lot of tips and tricks. So you'll see some of the examples of it later on, but provides a little bit more of an idea of actual change in some of these components. So from there, we, we worked with directors and CEOs and peer support co uh, coordinators across Canada to, and which they've uh, provided feedback in terms of a survey on the clarity, uh, uh, potential and anticipated effects, and so on and so forth about some of the items. Then we had a two hour online consultation meeting with this, this council to, to go over that survey and provide uh, further feedback. And then from there, we had we finally had a first draft, a draft or evaluation tool created. Uh, and then we went on to a process to look at um, uh, validity and reliability. Essentially from there, what we did is a think aloud method. So, so I'll, I'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, we looked at some test retests, and then we had uh, our research group across five meetings to look at and make edits to, to the tool. So specifically from this, this validity uh, component is that we had 20 mentees who responded to the tool while speaking their thoughts out loud. 
So essentially, they would complete it, and we'd have we interview them, but we'd be probing them to continue to, to uh, get all their inner thought inner thoughts out loud to us, so we can understand. Do they understand what the, the goal of, of that of that item is? Do they understand um, what we're trying to get at when we're measuring this? Do they is the item clear? So providing a lot of that out loud thinking allowed us to really know which items worked and which items didn't work. And then 10 days later, they also responded to the tool again without thinking aloud, but we did a, 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 a second small interview to get their general comments and thoughts about clarity. So uh, after getting that those uh, elements, we um, pulled all the utterances from um, each uh, the single item that, of what people said. So every time they talked about uh, their, their 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 thinking about an item, then we would pull it out and look at and find out if there was correspondence with what they're saying with actually the item and the outcome definition. And we internally rated as either what they were saying corresponded for each for each participant. It corresponded very well, corresponded a little, or was did not correspond at all. Provide us a little bit of a summary of which items that that the the peer mentees actually felt corresponded well or or didn't correspond so well. And from there, we then looked at we started with all the the poor corresponding items to find out what's going on, why isn't isn't it working? Is it about clarity? Is it about being stuck on, on certain words? And then we would we would reach cons consensus with with our, our, our larger group. Um, and then we would across five meetings, we then provided recommendations for modifications that we brought back to the larger partnership. Um, what we found from this is that 14 of the 20 items people understood really well. Six of them required modification, and most of the modification were, were wording changes. Um, for example, getting stuck is if one of the item had several others, how several others think, and then people were getting stuck, well, how many others? What several? So we're just removing some of those nuances to make sure we have more clarity on, on those elements. Um, so then we had two meetings with their partnership to finalize uh, decisions on these last six items. And essentially that was finalized um, a little over a month ago where we have now one outcome for each of the 20. So I'm just providing four examples here. A uh, couple of things that we came out from the Think Aloud is that we need to have a stem in front of every single item to remember participants, to remember peer mentees that they're thinking about it within the peer support context and not other contexts around their lives because other elements in their life could influence how they respond uh, to this. So for example, it's thinking about my experience with peer support, I feel a lot less understood or, or I feel better understood. Or um, in terms of skills, thinking about my experience with a peer support program, I learned no tips and tricks or a lot of tips and tricks from a peer mentor supporter on how to transition to the community living. So this now we have the ability, now we have a finalized set of 20 items, um, one item per, per, per outcome. Yep, Peter. Awesome, thank you, this is great work. Uh, I'm curious around, the scope of the mentorship, right? Like, so there's multiple ways in which lived experience is utilized, right? Like, so it can be straight up personal experience and providing the personal experience. It could be a trained translation of knowledge and using your personal experience, or it can be participation in research, leveraging your lived experience. How far did you go? Right or how narrow did you go? Did, did I go for in terms of define in terms of defining the, the peer support mentorship? So yeah, so that was within the peer support uh, programs that community uh, organizations deliver. So some so organizations very have to so, the programs. So it's very specific to the programs, and that maybe gets to the next point that the programs because. Well, I'll speak to the next few slides is that we're developing a toolkit to help programs identify which outcomes are actually most important for them so that they don't necessarily, the idea is that they might not assess all 20, they might only assess the ones that their program actually attempts to change. So okay. some programs like, for example, SCI Ontario might, through their, their, their different programming, might be focused on the certain outcomes versus SCIBC through uh, one of their programming might assess specific outcomes that might not be the same as Ontario. 
Mm-hmm. We want to give mm-hmm. the organizations the flexibility to choose the outcomes that are actually they're more intended so to, the, to impact. So, so does the definition of peer support vary from one one province to the next? The 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 way that it's that's why we were using more the peer support definition I talked about about the broader scheme. Some programs offer mentorship and some program more offer peer support. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's, Thank you. So that's that that's that's some of that flexibility that that our partners said it was really important for them to, when using this tool that they that's why the peer support program is in brackets because they can change it, they're going to name the program that they want to actually evaluate. Excellent. So that provides the context if it's something a bit more specific or if it's something very broad. And can it go can the evaluation go broader than the SCIO federation programs or it's specific to those programs? Right right now it's it's assessed from a, a general use from from the programs. Um, but in speaking in the last few meetings with the partnership, um, because they also work a lot with other organizations that are beyond like even SCI, they're, and they're yeah. talking with those, there seems that, that this might be applicable to the, a broader context than what we have actually done it in just simply because of the overlap. So I don't necessarily, we haven't tested it that way. So from a research perspective, I like from a researcher hat, I have to say it's, it's, it's bound within the SCI peer support programming, uh, but okay. from a practical standpoint, I, I think the, the, the use is much broader. So depends which Excellent. hat I'm wearing, I'll have a different argument. No, I, I, that was helpful. I think it's just, I, I, I wanted to like um, assess like for like different different programs. So I'm thinking like even John Shepard's program that he's on the, on the call t- today, right? Yeah. yeah. W- where it has its different nuances of how um, peer mentorship is is um, is is applied, yeah. and is the evaluation tools um, inclusive to all that or so not? The, the but one, saying- yeah, the one thing that the the tool is not inclusive to right now. This was a strategic decisions was for pre post assessments. Um, so okay. because people who would start who I had never exposed to peer support might not be able to answer this question because it's talking about think about my experience with the peer support program. We had, we had a meeting essentially to discuss which direction do we go and for them getting out a general assessment, general use of the tool to look at peer uh, mentees uh, perceived impact of the peer support program is was critical. And then the idea to move to more pre-post would be kind of the next phase, but we wanted to get this done first because it had the broader Fantastic. applicability versus a very versus a specific applicability for new program that's being launched excellent no i don't mean to derail your presentation i just i'm fascinated no, that's why i'm asking these, 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 these are all good you. questions and they're all questions that we have to go through as a partnership to make decisions on because unfortunately you just can't do everything in one of course in, in one one full sweep so thank but, you that's it thanks uh we are we almost okay. So maybe I'll just I'll just I'll a couple more slides, Brian, if that's okay, and then I'll I'll finish up. Um. So essentially, right now we we've just finished uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, or a month ago or so, the evaluation tool. So we're actually aiming to to submit this manuscript in the new year, and then we're developing a working group to create knowledge projects. So infographics, webinar, webinars, email distribution, so on and so forth. So our team's working on that now to be able to get the hands. Uh, um, to, to everybody. I think the one thing I do want to finish on is it, even in doing this and doing this in partnership, what what we also heard in a lot of the conversations with community partners is they're not sure how to navigate actually implementing evaluation in, in their programs. And uh, how do they use this this evaluation tool? Wow, what do they need to think about? So in fact, what we've, we've been doing the last year is actually creating a toolkit and this is just a, uh, the image here is, is a, the checklist guide on things um, that we can help community organizations to support them and how to use and implement the toolkit. Because just giving them the questions will likely not result in any uh, usage because they don't, there's not too sure what to do with them. So we had, so we conducted what are called near live sessions. So we gave the toolkit to an organization 
and we were flies on the wall, watched them work through the toolkit and realize what works and what doesn't, allowed us to reframe, redo it, and then do a second near live session. And we found that that first near live really helped resolve a lot of the issues of it. So now we're working with the SI Canada Peer Support Working Group, who are going to be providing comments on this one to finalize it, which will be in the suite of tools when we finally launch all this. Because simply giving questions to an organization is not sufficient to think about those those questions. So, um, yeah. So I think maybe just I'm just looking at the the time, um, and then what we're doing for in terms of next step would be to actually evaluate how organizations use and implement it. So um, we're going to use our reaim framework and specifically using the aim part to understand how organizations are adopting it. What is their readiness um, to adopt it? Because some organizations might not be ready to, to, to do any evaluation yet. So understand that whole adoptions from a qualitative perspective. The ones who are implementing, how are they implemented? What adoptions have they done? Is there any cost of this implementation? Um, what, what, is the, what is the consistency of implementation across organizations that use it? And then looking at the long-term practicality of, of it. So that is really the, going to be the focus of the next step is looking at, at that adoption implementation of the toolkit and the tool to make sure that what we're doing from a research perspective, perspective actually translate to being usage because we, we definitely don't want this to just fall on another uh, dusty shelf. Uh, we, we want it to be used. So we're engaging in that process to make sure that we can understand how that's being used. So um, I'll just finish. Maybe I'll just skip to a bunch of these slides. I don't want to give people. Um, but yeah, so I'll just finish there. Um, and I hopefully we I give you a little bit of a snapshot about some of the magic that we're trying to uncover um, about um, peer support in the spinal cord injury uh, context. So thanks again for the invitation. Um, thanks to the community organizations, my, my lab and my academic friends and the funding to help support this work. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, that was a great presentation. And I also enjoyed the uh, interaction. And so, Peter, thank you for those uh, very thoughtful questions along the way as well. Um, so we're going to open up to questions. And uh, as we open it up, I'll um, also be posting up uh, a quick poll or eval to uh, get your feedback on the presentation today. That will help us with future organization of these talks. Um, so I open up to any questions that uh, people may have. I to understand this is a in terms of evaluation, it's uh, extremely difficult um, for evaluating peer support because I've been asked on grants on peer support to um, how will we evaluate the cost effectiveness yes. of this, and um, it, it's very difficult. <laughs> There's no easy answer, so. Um, I don't even know if we could prop properly do that. So I, I can understand and appreciate the, the work that you're doing to try and, to get the TV. And I think some of that difficulty is because it's hard to assess the, the because we always talk about the magic and there's so many components, it's actually hard to assess what are the outcomes of it. So that's why it took us, you know, five, six years to go through this process to try to get at what are the outcomes and develop something that's that's usable. And then, and then, you know, once we, the organizations use it, then we'll find out how the tool actually works, right? That's still, we don't really know yet is how the tool actually function when it's actually in the hand. So hopefully, hopefully we can help with some of those analyses later if we're getting some of that data, Brian, so we can connect maybe on that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyone feel free to come in, either text your question or you can raise your hand or you can just even jump right in. Um, I was thinking as you're talking about the um, pre post uh, not being able to evaluate that with the toolkit that you have, I was wondering whether um, it could be evaluated, uh, um, but from a slightly different perspective. So um, you, you did mention that people cannot really answer it pre because they've not experienced the peer support, but um, maybe they could answer this in terms of their expectations. So maybe they could be asked um, if there was a, this program, what is their expectation of these outcomes as the pre, and then to compare that with after they've experienced it, 
how has our perception changed? And, and maybe that might be a, a means of getting at the value of the program itself, possibly. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know. That, that's, that's a good point. I think uh, the expectation could be an interesting what, way to look at. I mean, the other element is that we, we can still do, it may not be pre-post, but we can look, we can do this assessment over time after the, the, the exposure. So a lot of time it's it's hard to actually get a true pre-measure because depending if, if they're having their first contact in rehab or, or in, in a, a coffee group or something like that, then like it's that how do you administer like it's not it's not a research study right it's it's a living program from the organization so how do you assess if it's not a new program that you're launching but something that's continue it gets a little bit uh, trickier on, on on that front but uh mm -hmm. thinking that from an expectation could be an interesting uh way to also to look at it from that so thanks john you have a question john? i do yeah can you hear me yeah yes Fantastic. Um, thanks, uh, Shane. This is uh, great work and uh, really helpful. So um, really appreciate the chance to have a look at it. Um, I'm curious, in the course of doing this, what you've seen in other uh, you know, disease populations or you know con uh, health conditions uh, communities, whether it's the case that there is some other you know group like diabetes or arthritis or I don't know. Um, that is really advanced in the use of peer support where we could be learning things? Or is it the case conversely that spinal cord injury is uh, a population where um, maybe peer support is a bit of an area of excellence where we have things to share with other communities? Mm -hmm. from, from my experience, I mean, I'm interested to hear your thoughts as well, is when looking at the diabetes and mental health literature, which have uh, quite a bit more, their outcomes are pretty well-defined. So they're going to assess HB1HC for, for it to see if their program helps. And they're going to assess mental health because they're specifically targeting their, their peer support programs are actually targeting something very specific versus the peer support programs that our community organizations are running. They're not doing, they're not actually targeting specifically an outcome that we can assess. They are just helping for people with spinal cord injury to live better lives. And that's really broad. So I think that's some of the problems why we saw the smaller effect sizes because we're attributing from a research standpoint, oh, well, quality of life. But if you if you look at any assessment of quality of life, there's so many factors that affects quality of life beyond peer support. So your effects are naturally going to be smaller because you cannot actually capture that uniqueness of peer support on these broader research measures. So this is where I felt the big difference from an SDI perspective is because SCI works so much on uh, the peer support in SCI works so much on so many different facets and the different and different programs will work on different components uh, versus diabetes and, and mental health have a very specific and immeasurable endpoint um, uh, targeted. So, and the same thing with like, um, like, uh, like best Hulu hands, like, self-management it was designed your work uh, in peer support has actually had a much more defined outcome you know what you're trying to improve versus the the organization the programs are not necessarily targeting one specific outcome right so that that's where it got challenging that's why we went into this this process so um but yeah I'm your, your thoughts i mean i know you dove into a lot of this as well do you agree disagree with <laughs> what i'm saying yeah no 100 percent, 100 percent. i think you're absolutely right and um that's very helpful and it also helps then us understand why it was important to go through the process you went through to, to kind of winnow out those endpoints but i think it points to a you know a big problem in sci which is that you know it's a hugely heterogeneous condition it's a hugely variable population and there's no single endpoint you know i mean certainly no single biomarker like hba1c and but not even a single you know kind of thing that we're looking for and so it's really tough. It's really tough. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm with you in your struggle. I think we're in the same position of trying to figure out. We know that, as you say, there's magic here. How do we demonstrate that within the frameworks, you know, that are usually used to, um, you know, look at the effectiveness of things. And as Brian says, decide who, you know, whether they get paid for or not. I mean, that's where it hits the road. So, but the, this is super work. Uh, really looking forward to, to learning more and, and working with you guys in the future. Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Peter, was a uh, comment on 
the last uh, question or a separate question? Yeah, I just kind of wanted to build on what, what John was saying and how Shane was responding as well. I think, I think the value of peer support in our population is it's in our core. We use it for almost everything. We, we, we have adopted that concept that personal experience is an expertise in our field. And that's why things are so broad and can be, um, um, you can you can really leverage the the magic in in multiple different areas, and then we we bundle it broadly as quality of life. But have we thought about in the spinal cord injury population in really looking at some narrow views, particularly maybe around adoption of knowledge or um, prevention of secondary complication, and what the role in peer support plays in something very defined in like those two things I mentioned to kind of um, demonstrate in our field in spinal cord injury, how things can be used um, very specifically as well as very broadly. The So those are excellent points. And the thing I think that we need to do once this tool is launched is from these outcomes, I think I always, often refer them to that there are more proximal outcomes. So I think the idea and the outcome of understanding, feeling understood is, is critical in the peer support. It's probably, if you have the feeling uh, um, that you're, you're, you're being understood will then lead to maybe more hope, will then lead maybe to that more hope will lead to more um, quality of life. And I think we, we need the next step once we start using this tool is to find out which of these outcomes are actually more pro and and can, can we create a bit of a of a, a proximal medium long term outcome framework where we can look at relationships to say like yeah if you target these outcomes first you're more likely to then have impact on these outcomes later on and and I think we need to get there but we needed to develop this first before we really start looking yeah. at that so I from at least the conversations we've had from a qualitative perspective this idea of understanding is so at the core of of that peer support experience yes. and 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 is, a, is an outcome that's never assessed never measured and i took i, I it's been done in mental health so that's where i took yes. some of the 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 elements of uh, of argue ar the argument for why i think this is important is that there are some peer support work in mental health that when people felt understood they actually had higher levels uh, or better sure. mental health outcome reporting. So compared to when no, they might I agree with you. So. I agree with you because if you guys want to lead to that place of where well, can we create health economics behind the value of peer support, I think you're going to have to do that in bite sizes on mm -hmm. picking something like prevention or, um, as I said before, adoption of knowledge and then show how peer support throughout the continuum of rehabilitation plays a role in those spaces. And the value of that role can be quantified to against the healthcare system. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think we, we need to look at what are those, like so the, the bite size more proximal, what's the direct impact of it? And then then we can lead to those, those, those bigger analyses. Mm-hmm. Great work. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, that's a that's a Peter, great question and and uh, a great observation because I, and these outcomes themselves can be the starting point for um, further analysis on the sort of the downstream effects. Like a lot of work is slowly coming out in terms of the impacts of social isolation and the health impacts and, and whatnot. So um, seeing an effect here, we can with other research so bringing that in to see the broader impacts as well. So um, unfortunately, we are out of time. And I, I want to um, end today's talk by thanking Dr. Shane Sweet for and such an amazing, engaging, and uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, again, I, I, I put in, uh, in the poll for feedback for um, people who are here who um, would like to provide some feedback on today's talk that would be much appreciated as it is helpful in planning future lectures 
Um, also, I welcome any suggestions for future topics and speakers as well. Next month in 2024, we will actually be welcoming Dr. Jasmine Moth from the University of British Columbia, uh, who will be speaking in January. And uh, we hope to see you all then. So uh, Shane, do you have a few minutes if anyone have any more lingering yeah, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So right. uh, in advance, happy holidays to everyone. And um, we will see you in 2024. Great. Thanks for coming. Happy holidays.